In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. This morning we'll work through uh, the appointed gospel reading for this day. The opening uh, verses uh, of that text, Jesus said, For the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. Again, some of this kind of background stuff you may already know or be aware of, but um, that was kind of the procedure back in that day, that culture, is that where the day laborers would gather in the marketplace and they would wait for someone uh, to come around and hire them for the day. And so that's exactly what uh, the master of this house did in this parable that, that Jesus is telling. And uh, Jesus said that uh, this owner of the house went out early in the morning. And the way they reckoned time back in those days and in that culture, uh, early in the morning was probably like 6 a.m. because that's, uh, that's when the work day uh, traditionally began. And again, he agreed with the, uh, with the workers and apparently they were satisfied with that, said I'll pay you a denarius. And that was the monetary amount that was typical uh, for a day laborer uh, for a day's work. Next couple of verses. And going out about the third hour, he, the, the owner of the vineyard, saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And to them he said, you go into the vineyard too, and whatever is right, I will give you. So they went. Going out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour, he did the same. About the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing, said to them, why do you stand here idle all day? They said to him, because no one has hired us. And he said to them, you go to the vineyard too. So early in the morning, he got the first group to go out about 6 o'clock. Then about the third hour of the day, and that would be about 9 o'clock in the morning. And it's interesting that what he told these uh, workers, I'll pay you whatever's right. Okay, didn't mention a denarius or anything, just whatever's right, I'll, I'll give to you. And in uh, the parable, uh, the owner went out again about the sixth hour, the ninth hour, and the eleventh hour. And, uh, the sixth hour would be about noon, uh, the uh, ninth hour about 3 p.m., and the eleventh hour about 5 p.m., and the typical work day ended around 6 o'clock in, in the evening. And so that's how they all got to sent out into the vineyard. But then comes the shocker of the parable. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last up to the first. And when those hired about the 11th hour came, each of them received a denarius. That's the shocker. I mean, they worked one hour. And they say uh, they were given a whole day's wage. And then next couple of verses, now when those uh, hired first came, they thought they would receive more. But each of them also received a denarius. And on receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the heat, the uh, burden of the day, and the scorching heat. They grumbled about that. They only just received a denarius. Um, and quite frankly, if I were in their sandals, I believe I would grumble too. It just doesn't seem fair. Okay, and they, they made a point there. Now wait, we worked all day, you know, in the scorching heat, and we get the same thing. Uh, or those guys who work just one hour get the same as we do. That just doesn't seem fair. But then the owner replied uh, to them. He replied to one of them, friend, I'm doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? And again, uh, the response that I think I would have given is, well, yeah, okay, yeah, I agreed with that, but come on, let's be fair about this, huh? Look at what you're, you're giving them, uh, the same as you are giving me. It doesn't sound fair at all. But what's, I think, significant to remember about this text is that it's really the continuation and the conclusion of an exchange between Peter and, again, Peter sort of uh, stands in and speaks for the entire group of disciples, but a, an exchange between Jesus and Peter that had begun in the previous chapter. And to get what's going on there, we need to, to take a look at that. In the previous chapter, uh, what we have here is, uh, we're told, Matthew tells us, the crowds had followed, uh, followed Jesus 
from Galilee into Judea, so he was certainly gathering, you know, uh, some followers. Uh, I mean, if they had traveled that far with him, but they followed him to continue to hear him. And then Matthew tells us there was the incident where the Pharisees questioned Jesus about, uh, about divorce. And another, uh, he also says that uh, in this previous chapter that the people were bringing children to him for him to bless them. And that's where the disciples, again, sort of got their nose bent out of shape. And they said, well, no, don't, don't let them come, you know, you're bothering, bothering the master. Um, but then we read these verses here from, uh, from chapter, nine, uh, chapter 19. And behold, a man came up to Jesus saying, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. And he said to him, Which ones? And Jesus said, You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, all these I have kept, what do I still lack? Jesus said to him, if you would be perfect, go, sell what you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. When the young man heard this, he went his way, sor uh, way sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And then Peter said in reply, speaking to Jesus, See, we, the disciples, we have left everything and followed you. What then shall we have? And so this parable today is a continuation of that and is really an answer to Peter. Uh, when he asked, okay, look at all that we've done, you know, so if, uh, what, what should we get? Okay, this, this uh, one young man came, um, and he didn't, he didn't give up anything. He refused to follow you, but look at us. Okay, we've given up everything, or at least a lot, and we are following you, so what are we going to get? So the parable answers Peter's question. Now granted, the, those disciples, Peter and the others, certainly had left Maybe not everything, I don't know what everything means, but certainly they had left much to follow Jesus. But what they did not realize yet is that the extreme heat of the day that they were about to experience still lay before them. Okay, Peter's asking, what shall we receive? Well, they were going to receive a lot of heat. Okay, I guess maybe it started in Gethsemane especially, uh, at the arrest of Jesus, and the soldiers came up to arrest him, and there, there the disciples are standing there, and they're supposed to make up their mind what they're going to do. And again, uh, Peter being uh, the one who takes action before he thinks, you know, slices off the ear of Malchus, uh, which in Jesus heals the man's ear. But again, uh, they are going to experience some really great heat for being a disciple. Got even worse for Peter, I suppose, at, at the trial. Remember where he came and he stood in the courtyard warming himself, and there was this servant girl who says, you're one of them, aren't you? And we know what Peter did three times. He said, no, I don't, I don't even know the guy. Don't even know who he is. I mean, Peter was feeling the heat, was he not? And then, even on the day of resurrection, where was Peter and the others? Hiding behind locked doors for fear of the Jews. I mean, they were scared to death. They were afraid the same thing was going to happen to them that happened to Jesus. And so they were hiding out and in an undisclosed location, I guess. Uh, and even the doors were locked. They were so afraid. And I suppose at least tradition tells us for all of the disciples except John that they met, their, they met martyrdom for carrying the gospel to different parts of the world. So the disciples really did, you know, bear the burden of the day in this scorching heat. At this point when the parable is told, that all of that latter stuff hadn't happened yet. But Peter's argument is this. Jesus, you know, that guy left nothing and chose not to follow you. But look at us, the rest of the, he and the rest of the disciples. Look at our commitments. What 
we are doing is following you. And so what will we get for all our sacrifice? That's really the question on Peter's mind. The thing is that uh, when Peter made that claim in the earlier chapter, uh, that they had left everything and followed him, uh, Jesus didn't, you know, didn't question that. And then, okay, he, he recognized that yes, indeed, they had left, if not everything, then certainly they had left much. But in their grab for recognition, they overlooked Jesus' preface to this parable in today's text. And Jesus begins by saying, for the kingdom of heaven is like a master of the house. He is talking about the kingdom of heaven. Once again, Peter, again in the previous chapter, did what he had done before. Remember when Peter jumped to Jesus' defense, or at least that's what he thought he was doing, when Jesus said that he would uh, be given over to the hands of sinful men and suffer and die. And he also said, and rise again on the third day, but they did, that didn't register when Jesus said that. And, Je and Peter jumped to Jesus' defense, no, Lord, that's never going to happen to you. You know, you're not going to suffer and die. That's not what the Messiah is supposed to do. That will never happen to you at all. And Jesus said to him, Peter, you know, get behind me, Satan, huh? Get behind me, Satan. You're thinking uh, not things of God. You're thinking the things of men. And that's what's happening here in this conversation, this exchange, uh, actually over a couple of chapters length, uh, between uh, Jesus and Peter. When uh, Peter is asking for what they are going to get because for all of their commitment and their dedication, uh, she, he, they're thinking the things and the ways of men, not the ways of God. And so the vineyard owner, and in the vineyard, in this parable, the vineyard owner is Jesus. He describes how things in the kingdom of heaven work, which again, Peter and the others apparently too had not caught on to yet. Here's what, the, what it's like in the kingdom of heaven, Jesus says. Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? That's the way things work in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is generous. He is generous to all on an equal basis. We all know John 3.16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but ever have, ever have, have everlasting life. No time minimum required at all. Whoever believes. All who confess Jesus is what Jesus is saying in this parable. All who confess him, regardless of how long or under what circumstances they have lived as his disciples, all receive the denarius. The full promise of God. That's what Jesus is saying. And so now we have to turn the parable from Peter uh, to us, to ourselves. Some, maybe even many, among us gathered here today and, and among the whole body of Christians, I suppose, some or maybe many consider themselves uh, to be the all-day workers in the vineyard, the all-day workers in God's church, the all-day workers on behalf of God's mission. And indeed, we may have been. I suppose I can take myself for an example of that. Um, I don't remember ever being, you know, not a Christian and not, not being in church. I mean, I had Christian parents. Uh, they take, took me to church in Sunday school, always been in church in Sunday school. I've always been a believer. Not my doing, of course, but again, that's the gift that God has given me all of my life. And like all, you know, good Lutherans, or at least good Lutherans in the past, anyway, I went to confirmation class, okay, had it on Saturday morning, hated that, but I went, 
I had no choice. My parents had said, you're going. And so I dutifully went. And uh, we had two years of confirmation, and I don't know whose idea this was, if it was the pastor at the time or, uh, or someone in the church, but uh, and that's back in the day when for, for confirmation classes, maybe some of you can still remember that, I mean, uh, we had tests. And we were graded. And we were given great points. And again, someone in, in our congregation I grew up in, this is a, a moderate-sized congregation, not real large, not real small. Again, back in the day when there were a lot of kids in confirmation class, uh, our, our class had, as I recall, you know, 10 or 12 you know, in confirmation class. And the thing was is that the congregation uh, for, the, for the person in the class uh, who at the end of two years had the highest grade point average you know, throughout the, those two years of confirmation, they would give a scholarship to a Lutheran camp for a confirmand retreat up, uh, up in Arcadia, Michigan, the upper part of Michigan. Well, I bore the heat of the day. I got the highest score. And I got that scholarship to camp. I beat out the second person, as I recall, by like 1% or something like that. It was close. That was Esther Cloper. She was my challenge. But anyway, uh, I got the higher grade point average and uh, got to go to camp. So again, I studied. I did the work. You know, I bore the heat of the day uh, of confirmation instruction. And then a little bit later, I guess I was even at the confirmation time thinking about this, but a little bit later I started thinking more seriously about, you know, Maybe I would like to be a pastor. I'd like to look into that. You know, maybe God's calling me to do that. And so this, again, is back in the day. Some of you may remember when uh, the Missouri Synod had a series of high school and residential high school and junior colleges uh, throughout the country. The closest one to me at that time was in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Concordia, Milwaukee, at high school and junior college. And so I was thinking to be a pastor. I think I would like to give that a try. And so when I was in the 10th grade, I went away from home. I gave up a lot, and I had a nice home, good parents, you know, a lot of friends in my little small town. But I gave all of that up, and I went to uh, Concordia, uh, Milwaukee, for high school and junior college. Some people would call it pastor boot camp, but it was uh, that's the kind of thing that it was back then. And so I went and went through Junior, uh, high school there, junior college, and then at the time, uh, the campus where the Fort Wayne Seminary is now, that was a, a senior college back then, the last two years of college education. I went there, went to seminary, and became a pastor. I can identify with Peter. Lord, look what I've given up. <laughs> you know, I've borne the heat of the day. What am I going to get for it? And maybe some of you could maybe have some similar kind of ideas. Maybe. I don't know. Maybe it's just me. But that parable Jesus told is told to us as well. For those of us who may think that maybe we should get more than others. But again, you know, I, uh, and again, with maybe many others of us here, uh, a, with Peter may have to lower our head and mumble our grudging agreement to what Jesus said when he said, I, am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me, or do you begrudge my generosity? <coughs> yeah, yeah, Lord, I know, that's right. You're right, you can do whatever you want with yours. You know, I shouldn't have been thinking that way. But still, sometimes we may have the idea that we're still struggling with the unfairness, at least in our, our understanding, the unfairness of it all. Maybe we know some guy, some woman, uh, who uh, has lived a, a dissolute life, uh, completely hedonistic, unashamedly unholy life, possibly even a criminal life, with total disregard for other people, for the God, for the church, and somehow, through some means, comes to an 11th hour confession of faith. And he's given, that woman, that man is given the same as me, the full denarius, the full blessing of God. Sometimes it may still seem, well, just not quite right. 
But if there's even a hint of that kind of thought in your mind or in my mind as well, this is something I think we need to consider. That 11th hour confession person just came to faith at the very end of the day, maybe even at the very end of his life or her life. That person has lived his or her whole life without the blessed assurance of Jesus' promised denarius. All the rest of their life, they had no idea what, what God is promising them in Jesus. And they had to live without that their entire life, up until the last hour, the 11th hour. They had to live their entire life without knowing God's love for them in every circumstance of life. Because they certainly had difficult times as well. But they were, had nothing to do with God, knew him not at all, had no confession of faith, had no idea, no awareness of God's love for them and his willingness to be with them through all the difficult times of life. That person who came to faith only at the last hour, the 11th hour, lived that, lived his or her whole life without experiencing what our Lutheran confessions call the conversation and the consolation of the brethren, which basically means the caring and supportive fellowship of the body of Christ. That person who lived without knowing Christ and his church, his body, they didn't have that kind of support. They didn't have that kind of care from the body of Christ and fellow believers. If we ever start thinking that, well, you know, it's really not fair. That person comes to faith in the 11th hour, and I've been a faithful person all my life. I've given up so much. It doesn't quite seem fair. We have to also remember that person has missed out on so much has missed out on stuff that you and I have known for probably longer than that. There may be an 11th hour person here, I don't know that, but I bet many of us, if not most of us, have known Christ and God's work through him for most of our lives. That 11th hour person didn't, has missed out on so much. And the other thing to consider, every 11th hour Conversion, when someone comes to the faith at the very end of their lives, at the end of the day as they experience it, that gives us the opportunity to rejoice with those who rejoice. For every person who comes to faith at the last moment, we can rejoice with that person for the joy and hope and peace that they have found in coming to faith. And not only will we be rejoicing with that person, we will be rejoicing with the angels. For what, the angels give thanks over one sinner who repents, right? And no matter what time of day it is, even at the end. So we rejoice with that person, we rejoice with fellow believers, we rejoice with the angels. And lastly, even those of us who have been all day laborers in God's vineyard, all day, faithful disciples of Jesus. Again, not without sin, of course, but basically Christians all our lives. We, too, have received what those one-hour workers receive. Grace. For we do not deserve the denarius no matter how long we have worked any more than those who come to faith at the 11th hour. It's only by the grace of God that even we as much and as faithful as we may have been, even we need the grace of God. Now, we do not earn or deserve the denarius either. Not at all. But all who come to faith in Christ, no matter when, receive his generosity, his grace, that comes through us, through the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And for that, for ourselves, and for those who come to faith at any time during the day, we say thanks be to God. Amen. Now may the peace and the power of God 
which passes all of our human understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus now and always. Amen. Amen.